Hey guys, so let's talk about why we have a global banking system. I think a lot of people know, if you've watched A Wonderful Life, you know why we have a domestic banking system. Um, but why do countries need to make loans to other countries? Um, why do we even have something that, that allows us to make loans across borders? When usually when we watch a movie, we know that typically the life of a bank um, or a bank teller or a bank loan officer is dealing with human beings, dealing with domestic people who come in, who want to balance their checkbooks, um, who need, to, who need to, get a, to get a small business loan of some sort. Um, and, and, and then, of course, you know, you can sort of work your way backwards and think about things like credit worthiness and why we have something called a FICO score. Um, and, you know, ultimately the bank becomes the center, um, the, sort of the central engine of the economy uh, because without it, uh, you, you necess wouldn't necessarily have a small business. You wouldn't necessarily have uh, the ability to buy that car today. You would have to wait 10 years. So uh, most of us know why we have a domestic banking sector. So a lot, most people don't know why we have a international banking sector. And, and part of that is because, um, well, let's just try to talk about that. Um, and number one, if we don't have, if say a country like the United States does not have a domestic, uh, sorry, a, a banking sector that loans to other countries, it's very difficult to have reliable allies. Um, it's, it's a bit like marriage, right? If you're all in the same boat together, um, if you all have the same mortgage, um, you're probably going to try to, you know, align your interests um, as well as uh, a lot of other things. And so typically, you know, the, the idea behind making loans to other countries is not only to facilitate cross-border relationships, but to align interests. And one way, if you look at you know things like NATO and all these other like you know uh, international organizations like the UN, they're all designed to get people to come together and be on the same page. W with respect to the U.S., the reason that you know we have such a large banking banking sector uh, is because it's uh, a couple of reasons. Number one, um, it's to project power. Um, and you know, number two is to project, it's, it's essentially is to prevent other countries, other c competition from coming in um, and, and essentially taking up you know, space that would otherwise be, or that could otherwise be used for American products. So number one, project power. Number two, you know, you know the U.S. only has about four or five percent of the world population. And so we spend a lot of money on innovation. A lot of that innovation necessitates debt. And most of it in the past has been done by the government. You know, you can think like NASA, um, uh, you know, RAND, and so on. But now private companies are becoming as credible, if not more so, than governments. And so a company like Amazon cannot make a profit um, for quite some time. And essentially, you know, suddenly it's, it's not just selling books, it's going into space. Um, and so you, there's a bit, of, bit of a bit of a shift, um, especially as, you know, the idea of governments projecting power has become more and more difficult as competition has increased. Uh, there's lots of ways of dealing with that competition. One of them is tariffs, um, and uh, but we, that's a different discussion. So number one, project power, uh, and number two, you know, try to recoup a lot of the investment that you've made, especially if you have a small population. Try to recoup that investment you've made in, in innovation by selling the innovation to other countries. And so you're a business, you know, let's keep, keep the numbers small. There's a $1 million loan. And ultimately what you do is you, you know, take out a million dollar loan, you invent this beautiful app. And if you're only able to sell the app within your own country, uh, it might be very difficult to, you know, recoup that or pay back the loan, or, you know, be, or even make a profit. And part of that reason, of course, is, you know, even in the U.S., even though the U.S. does have four or five percent of the world population, uh, within the U.S., only about half the population has more than six hundred or seven hundred dollars in a bank cash. Um, even one of the one of the latest um, representatives, I think, has seven thousand dollars in a bank, but she also has, at the age of twenty nine, between uh, between fifteen and fifty thousand dollars in student loans, um, apparently. So um, ultimately, you know, you, we're, we're in a position where you know you, you've got this idea where you know you want to project that. Not only you know, an, an, an app is a, a, a kind of a silly example because in the past, post World War Two, um, you know the export would be bridges, it would be QA, quality control um, metrics and processes. It would be things that would make the country better. And that's why today, uh, you know, you go to Japan, it's a better country 
uh, obviously, than 1945, but it's also, a, at least with Tokyo, uh, it's also a better city than most American cities. You go to Germany, the same thing um, in terms of public infrastructure. Uh, the train system is so good that almost nobody flies. And as a consequence, Air Berlin has gone bankrupt because the train system is, is so good. Um, part of me thinks it's, it's that train system is so good for you know many reasons, many of them tragic, uh, but it's also the same situation um, in, in the UK, you go to London, again, public infrastructure, not just in uh, the public transportation system, but in the NHS, the healthcare system. So, number one, project power, because if you don't sell that app or you don't sell that, you know, let's take, let's take Facebook. If, if Facebook does not go into a neutral country, uh, then maybe it's WeChat that comes in and suddenly that, that first mover advantage uh, takes over that country and then some other competition can't come in. And suddenly you're dealing with trying to infiltrate a market uh, and trying to expand and pay off your debts, uh, but without, you know, now you've got this massive competition going on. And that, again, all, it all goes back to projecting power um, and also trying to pay off your own debt. So it's a, it's a two-way street, uh, as we've seen when it works with Japan, Germany, and, the, and even the UK, which was bankrupt in 1945, even though it technically won, what was one of the winners of World War II. Um, with, with respect to projecting power, there, it's, it's a two-sided coin, uh, because if you try to project it too much, like the Soviet Union, and you overextend yourself, and even if you do end up building trains that are still used to this day, and, and escalators that are still used to this day, um, you know, if, if, you, if it's too much money and, and the people in, the, in these other countries that are essentially satellites of your system, of your economic and, and security system, if there's not enough of a, uh, of a method to pay back the money, or the workers, then you kind of have this different, then you kind of have a system, right? And that's really what it comes down to. Do you want to have a private sector that creates a, a, a investment opportunities, especially in the private sector that allows the payment of these loans? And, and what I like to tell uh, myself when I try to explain the differences between a Soviet system and, and a Western system is, you know, obviously this is a very simple way of looking at it, but, you know, one of them is, is like accounting on a cash basis. Uh, you know, you, you don't have these fancy shenanigans in accounting uh, with GAP or pro forma. You just sort of make the loan, you get the, you get the infrastructure done, and then, you know, you essentially extract natural resources from this other country to pay you back. Um, and, you know, they don't, you don't have all these, you don't necessarily have a need for a massive banking system. Um, and, and therefore, you don't have a, a system like, you don't, have the, you don't have the ingredients for a, you know, sort of widespread 2008, 2007, 2008, 2009 boom bust cycle. But of course, if you have um, less regulation under the Western system, um, you have a lot of different comp comp you know, competitors. What's strange, uh, so obviously the tax receipts that go into paying back all these loans you've taken out, they're uneven. And so you try to you have to borrow money from abroad in order to in order to smooth things over um, as you eventually pay off the loans. So the idea behind a country uh, a country's credibility is that you know countries are technically infinite. They have an infinite lifespan. That's not true. Germany, uh, the German government probably did not pay back its you know uh, the loans under the Weimar Republic. I, I, I don't know, but uh, you know the idea really is you know if, if you're in Singapore like I am now, you know why would somebody take out a loan in Singapore? It's a tiny country. Uh, and the, one of the reasons that people do think that this country is very creditworthy, even even this, despite the passing of its you know incredible prime minister like KY, uh, is because it's linked to a Western finance system uh, that that tends to project power. Now, if one day the U.S. wakes up and says, uh, you know, in, in the morning and just decides, you know, we don't want to support Singapore, um, you know, Singapore still has a lot of money in a in a sovereign wealth fund. Um, but the question is, you know, it's no longer tied to this sort of infinite lifespan uh, because of, 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 of its small size and its, you know, sort of a, its, its necessity for trade with international, um, with just international trade. Uh, it, it can't necessarily, you can't really trade with itself. It's too small, um, especially given its lack of natural resources. So we see a kind of a shift, right? The Soviet Union well, had, had a lot of natural resources. It was able to, you know, use that in order to expand its influence. The U.S. Um, has become, for many countries, the, uh, you know, the, the exporter of oil and natural gas. Uh, certainly, the fact that it's priced in U.S. dollars, which is another reason for the projection of power, uh, is that, like I said, it's not just that you trade with somebody, you trade with somebody else, and then you're able to implement your own financial system. That's the key with global trade. That's why I'm sitting here in Singapore and I've got access to Scottish jam, 
Um, there's no reason for me to have access to this jam unless this country is on a Western-based system. And I don't have, unfortunately, I don't have access to, um, you know, Russian sort of uh, waters. They have it. I don't have access to it. Um, and so, again, a lot of what we see is based on this projection. Uh, the, but again, the reality of all of this is, is it better for me as a consumer? Is it better for you as a worker? Uh, that's, these are the questions that most, most politicians can't answer. Uh, these are very complex questions post-World War II, when all these agreements don't seem to be working out very well for people at the very bottom, um, unless they want to go in debt um, and achieve a kind of a debt slavery uh, which is the criticism of the Western system, is that you do have this banking sector, uh, but all it's really doing is, is expanding a slave-based economy uh, to the extent that you don't own your own house until you've worked for a bank for 30, for 30 40 years, or 15 or 30 years. So there's a lot of critic criticisms on that side, and the real question is how do you fix the problem uh, you know, without increasing segregation, without having, say, a social credit score, uh, which is what China is rolling out, uh, because these these are you know without having you know total surveillance with um, and trying to use all this technology that's now abstract and digital, um, how do you export all of that? Uh, especially when so much of it is is based on security, uh, which is also based on surveillance. And this is a which is again completely different from say building a bridge, building a train system, building a healthcare system, uh, city planning. Uh, what works? What doesn't work? Uh, the more you go into the abstract, the more it becomes, you know, the more that debt, you know, necessitates a big picture viewpoint. And the more you become, the easier it is to become distant from the people at the very bottom of the pyramid who, again, are the ones building the pyramid. And anyway, I don't have the answers, uh, but I think it's very important to understand why a global banking system is so important. Um, you know, it, it allows, again, the projection of power, um, which should which should facilitate uh, peace, uh, because it, because it, it aligns interests. Um, that's again the number one reason. But also, it's based on it's, it's because of competition. Um, you know, it's based on innovation. How do you you know how do you justify taking out a lot of loans um, if you if they're not going to be paid back? And one way you pay back loans is you export something, um, especially if you don't have a, an economy that has a lot of natural resources. Uh, so you know you have to have you know, alignment between the banking sector and the government and private corporations in order to facilitate innovation uh, and then eventually to export that to other countries that don't have something that you, that, that would benefit from this innovation uh, that would then again allow both sides to benefit uh, from an overall security economic framework. Um, so the idea again behind all that is the foundation is creativity and innovation. And the question is whether that creativity, that digital creativity and, and innovation, the stuff that we can't touch anymore, that we've, what we've invested trillions of dollars into, uh, whether or not that is um, a viable path forward uh, post-World War II. Uh, and uh, Joshua Ramo um, has a book on this. And again, he, he talks about creativity and innovation being the drivers of human progress based on something called a social, sorry, a caring economy. Uh, it's something that's worth looking, looking into, but ultimately the question is how do you maximize innovation and how do you maximize creativity if all this digital infrastructure is taking away things like privacy? And these are all big, big questions that go back into why we have a global banking sector.